get started. Do wrinkle haven't not had a mouse in here before. Now it's a touch screen, so we can get around that. It's a little bit weird to not have the keyboard without the mouse. Um, so apologies for the mix up with the uh, with the quiz this weekend. Something about the way the files got imported, I think it unpublished one of the one of my top level folders, and then which meant all the stuff that I hit publish on for the um, for the figures was still showing you guys as being denied. I think I got it all fixed. Um, and I'll make sure that that doesn't, it shouldn't happen again. I think I corrected the problem, um, but it was just some some weirdness there. So apologies. So if you haven't retaken it with the actual figures, do that when you get a chance today. Um, and uh, and you know, obviously it won't be able against you as late or anything like that, because that was all my bad. Um, but I did get to, I can always tell that OCHEM is, is when, when chemistry, um, when shit gets real, for lack of a better term, for people, because all of the questions pretty much were about the material um, and stuff we talked about last week. Very, you know, I think I had one random question out of the four that was, um, that was a random chem chemistry question versus um, a lot of questions about orbitals and wave functions and, um, and, uh, trying to understand how how the stuff we talked about last week affects um, actual chemistry stuff. Um, so that's usually my indication that that we're getting some new material that y'all feel a little uncomfortable with, which is okay. Um, okay, and second year and up classes are meant to feel a little uncomfortable because you're pushing yourself, you're seeing stuff you haven't seen before. Um, so we'll start by going through, I can, I talk about quiz questions. Um, so first, I thought that would start with the most basic. We talked about how how we teach things. I teach you things, and then later you learn that that what you actually learned is not quite as accurate as it could be. Um, and it's I take a bit of I won't say take offense, but I take issue with the word dogmatic. Because it's less that it's that it's dogma that shouldn't be questioned, and more that we're getting progressively deeper and deeper levels of detail. Um, if you're teaching, if you're teaching a kid to read, you don't start with with um, Moby Dick, right? Um, we get the basics down, and then and the general rules, and then we explore. And this is kind of how research works too. The way we approach teaching this mirrors how research is done. You get the general cases right and gen learn the general rules, and then you go and say, well, there's exceptions. Why are there exceptions? And then you look at why there are exceptions. We learn about why the exceptions are there. And then, but the thing is, in, when something is complicated is, as how, ma how matter works and how orbitals work, the exceptions have exceptions. And it just, you just keep getting layers upon layers of complexity and so nothing that, that we're, we teach you at, young, at the lower levels is wrong. It's just overgeneralized sometimes. Um, so, but I do try to at least bring up what those oversimplifications, what those assumptions are, even if I'm not going to be testing you on them. I'll say, you know, here's where it falls apart, but I'm not going to test you on that on a time situation because I want you to get the general rules right. Um, but I didn't think that was worth discussing. Why? What's the logic for why we approach it that way? Um, when we're talking about hybridization, does hybridization change with different arrangements when concerning isomers? Absolutely. There's lots of different ways that you can arrange the same the same molecular formula that doesn't have um, the same hybridization. For instance, if we look at Um, we look at C5H10. The simplest way that you can have that formula is to take an alkane and make it into a ring structure. So C5H12 would be a saturated alkane, meaning um, you could have a straight chain, you could have um, you could have branches. We talked about all, all possible isomers for C5H12, right? C5H10 is missing a pair of hydrogens, which means 
it either has a pi bond or it has a ring structure. If we draw it as a ring structure, we get something that looks like this. We count hydrogens and carbons, there's C5H10. Didn't leave myself room there to write out hydrogens. There's 10 hydrogens, 10 carbons. What's the hybridization on those carbons? Yeah, they're all sp3, right? In fact, we'll talk about, about how to determine when, if you have distinct carbons down the road, but it turns out all the five of these carbons are identical. In terms of energetically, it's not like a, a straight chain of five where you could have the end carbon, one from the end or the middle, right? Those are all distinct carbons from each other. In this case, because it's a ring structure, you can start counting that's carbon one. You can start counting anywhere, and they're all the identical carbons. They're all sp3, they're all attached to two other carbons. We can take that same formula though. Faster. Put a pi bond in the middle. And then if we count hydrogens, that's still C5H10, right? We definitely changed the hybridization because we have added a P or, or a, a pi bond here, right? So we have unhybridized P orbitals on those two carbons. So that's so SP3. SP3, SP3, but these two are SP2. So definitely different ways of arranging the same formulas can change the hybridization. And we'll actually find today when we start talking about resonance, um, you can have, it's not even an isomer, it's the same molecule with the electrons drawn in a slightly different configuration that makes it look like the hybridization changes. It's what's called resonance is the idea that electrons, it comes from the idea the electrons are really existing in this whole probability cloud all at once. Um, and it turns out that sometimes there's more than one good structure that you can draw that's the same where everything's connected, all the sigma bonds are the same, but the lone pairs and the pi bonds can move around. Um, and you wind up with it behaving differently um, as a result of that. So it's, it's definitely something we're going to get into more depth with, with hybridization because it keeps being important. And in fact, let me pull up the um, the ah, we'll do that when we talk about residents. Hang on. I take it back. All right, and then I mentioned antibonding orbitals, which is a weird thing, right? Um, so antibonding orbitals, to be more specific about why they occur, when we're taking these dis different orbitals and we're overlapping them together, when they overlap and we get the same phase overlapping, we get constructive interference meaning that's a, that's a more stable situation usually because you can put electrons in both orbitals at once when you have constructive interference like that. And so that's really what a sigma bond is, is when you have, um, we'll just make them sp3 orbitals. And so let's say that they're in phase, Because they're in phase and those in phase orbitals are overlapping, we get constructive interference, we get a bonding orbital. And what that can really look like is that's really like the sp3 orbital from this side plus the sp3 orbital over here. And if you just think of it as functions, as wave functions, you can literally just add function A plus function B. And as long as they're in phase, you get constructive interference. But that means that there's also an, an analogous um, way we can we can add these together. If we instead of saying sp3 plus sp3, if we do the same orbitals, we do sp3 minus the second sp3, 
with that negative sign, remember that that's not meaning that the, that the charge on the electron is changing. It means that we flip the phase when we do that. If we can add them together, we can also subtract them together. This is just, it's, we're just saying that this is a possible way to mix these together. Um, and anytime you can add them together, you can also subtract them. In this case, if you've subtracted them, so keep that one as having the same um, phase. I'll switch colors to the other one. Well, now this one's out of phase because we subtracted instead of adding. So that flips the phase on these two pieces. And when you do that, now instead of having constructive interference here, we get destructive interference. And instead of having them overlap to make a bond, we wind up with them making a shape that looks more like there's, they're kind of like more squashed. And then there's like a very distinct line where there's absolutely no interaction. So we, by subtracting them and then being out of phase, we create a node in between where there's no interaction. And so that's really what an anti-bonding orbital is. It's, this, it's also a possible combination of the two, but with a negative sign more or less. And what that looks like in terms of energy, the reason we don't see that all the time is because if we bring these so we, we think about the y-axis as being energy. If we bring two orbitals up to each other and we allow them the ability to overlap and make these, these uh, this constructive interference, it's more stable to have these orbitals filled than not filled, right? That's why bonds happen, because it's more stable than not happening. Because that allows these two to wind up in the same orbital together. And so you wind up making when you add those two together and you get that constructive interference, it actually lowers the energy of the two orbitals to make one new hybridized, right? And so the lower energy state, you're gonna put both electrons in there. And so energetically, this is what's happening. But if you can do it, but we started with two orbitals, right? We, and we let them overlap to make a more stable orbital, but we don't get to just get rid of orbitals. Orbitals are just these mathematical functions and you have to have enough orbitals um, participating, enough energy levels for these electrons to go into. And that means that if we started with two orbitals, we still have to have two orbitals left. One of them looks more stable. The other one is gonna be less stable and that's our anti-bonding orbital. So usually it's somewhat symmetric. If you take upper division chemistry classes, they'll pick, they'll talk about how you can start with the, if you um, start with two different energy levels, you can estimate roughly how far apart these are. Are they downhill in energy or, um, or more shifted up? But either way, you're not going to put electrons into that anti-bonding orbital unless you still have more electrons floating around, right? If you only have the two electrons, they're going to go to the more stable state. And that's just going to remain there. That, that anti-bonding orbital exists, but there's no electrons in it. It's, it's an empty room, so to speak. Um, why does this, how do we know that these anti-bonding orbitals actually exist then? Well, because if we can predict, if we can use some, some really high-end math to figure out what these energy levels are relative to each other, this allows us to predict change in energy that allows us to move an electron from a low energy level to a high energy level, which you might remember talking about semiconductors and, and uh, LEDs. Bumping an electron from a low energy level to a high energy level, first thing it wants to do is fall back down, in which case it would give off light. But the other thing that can happen is once you take one electron from a bonding orbital and you put it into an anti-bonding orbital, that actually allows that bond to totally dissociate as well. So this is why some elements will absorb light in the UV region and break down the compounds. Because by shining the right wavelength of light, you actually move electrons into an anti-bonding orbital and 
allow that entire molecule to fall apart. So hydrogen peroxide does this. Anything you see sold in a pharmacy in those opaque um, brown bottles, they keep selling in those bottles because UV invisible light does this to those. So iodine, they don't sell bromine in the store, but bromine does the same thing. If you shine UV light on it, it dissociates um, hydrogen peroxide, all have this property where near the visible region, you can use, use light to bump up an electron into an antibody, which makes it really unstable. Um, so just anti the idea of anti-bonding orbitals is going to keep coming back. And it's not really, it's a new term, but we kind of talked about that a little bit in Gen Chem. At least I usually do when we, do, when we teach quantum. We talk about how like moving electrons to different energy levels does some interesting stuff. We didn't really talk about breaking the bonds apart by doing that, but that happens too. And you will see that in OCHEM. We'll do some labs where we'll shine UV light on something as the catalyst to make a reaction happen. And it works by doing this. And then the one random question, um, interactions between gut microbiomes and medication, pharmaceuticals, does do, do different people's gut biomes have um, an effect on how, how well certain medications work? Very, fairly rarely, if it's a, if it's a fat soluble compound, if it's a fat soluble vitamin or, um, medication, then it can but most medications that are that you take orally are water soluble and water soluble medications primarily get absorbed through the stomach lining so and your gut microbiome doesn't really start affecting things till you hit the small intestine um so in general it doesn't make that big of a difference um for most cases Again, as you get to some of the, the, I won't say weirder, but some of the um, more fringe cases in terms of um, any anything that is primarily absorbed through um, a fatty or through a phospholipid bilayer, like um, like vitamin K, for instance, but or vitamin D, lots of, of fat soluble vitamins um, are absorbed through the lining of the small intestine because they're fat soluble rather than water soluble. And those ones might be slightly affected, but in general, there's not that much variation from one person to another as far as gut biomes go. Most things are relatively similar. Um, if you took a long enough time scale approach, if you looked at today versus 300 years ago, then you'd see a, 300 years ago when people were traveling a lot less to different areas and um, there's a lot less. Um, homogeneity in terms of what people ate, you might see a bigger difference in gut biomes and you might be able to tie that, but they didn't really use pharmaceuticals the way we did back then. We don't really have that data. So it's kind of hard to say, um, but on a day-to-day -day basis these days, we don't need to worry about that too much. Um, and I don't think, generally speaking, it's considered too much unless there's a specific reason to look at it when they're doing trials. Um, when pharmaceuticals are trialed, usually are tested these days, they're kind of designed um, before they ever trip, um, test them in a living organism because we know what the structure of pharmaceuticals are. And in fact, usually we know what the structure of the protein we're trying to act on is what the active site is shaped like. And so we actually can design pharmaceuticals totally on paper, well, on computers, before we actually ever make them and try them. So it's a little bit less the random approach of, we made a new chemical today, let's go give it to a rat and see what happens. Um, they generally know what's gonna happen before they start animal testing at any level. Um, so it's there's a lot less surprises when it comes to pharmaceutical discovery now compared to um, what, what we used to see because, and there are still surprises, but they're more on the level of, oh, we expected to act on this you know, serotonin receptor site, but it actually interacts more strongly with this um, you know, noradrenaline site. Um, that's weird, rather than, I wonder if this is going to kill the rat or not. Um, so it's just at a different level of trial. Um, so we, 
but I don't think gut biome is generally considered. But then again, um, I'm not a pharmaceutical chemist and I have, haven't taken a biochem class in a few years. So um, that may be changing for all I know. All right, any other quiz questions before we get going? Who remembers talking about polarity in gen chem? Polar molecules. Anybody remember what the two criteria were for polarity? True negativity. Yeah, we needed a different. What about electronegativity? Like the difference between things that are, that are. We need a bond that has a big difference in electronegativity from one side to the other. Anybody remember what the other criterion was? That helps um, because that, that causes what I want to look for next. We needed asymmetry. So with inorganic molecules where we had one central atom, we needed both asymmetry and polar bonds. If you had polar bonds with no asymmetry, then you were pulling electrons around, but you're, they're being pulled equally in all directions. So for instance, we did carbon tetrachloride. That's still a tetrahedral shape. We definitely have polar bonds. We pop, well, I'll throw the electronegativity uh, figure out here in a second so we can refresh our memory. Um, but we know fluorine is super electronegative. It's really big bully. It's really good at pulling electrons towards itself. But if it's the same in all dimensions, it's a nonpolar molecule because all of the tug of war is pulling the electrons all equally in all three dimensions. Um, so that results in an overall nonpolar molecule, even though you have polar bonds. Now, in general, in this class, the asymmetry aspect is going to be less of an issue because almost everything we look at is going to be asymmetric. Because once you get larger than one carbon, one central atom, that's almost always enough to throw off the symmetry so that you have one part of the molecule that's not identical to the other part of the molecule. Um, so even something that looks symmetric, like if we looked at, this is acetone. Acetone still looks fairly symmetrical, right? Turns out it's not all the way symmetrical. It's symmetrical here. There's a line of symmetry we call a mirror plane. But it's not some, there's no mirror plane up and down. So we have a polar bond between the carbon and the oxygen. Oxygen's pulling the electrons, that's the, that's why, um, towards itself, away from everything else. So we still have a net pull. We still have that asymmetry. Um, so in general, we're less concerned with the asymmetry once we get to the M. But still worth remembering because there are a few. That's what we ended with the other day. I was talking about how pi bonds change the shape and the bond energy. Um, bond energy, just to reconnect it back to those anti-bonding orbitals. Bond energy is... It depends a little bit on how it's defined. Um, but generally speaking, bond energy is the amount of energy that you get when you bring those two orbitals up to each other and let them hybridize. So this difference right here is your bond energy. And so we can actually put that in terms of, of regular energy units. Um, it's not just something that's super qualitative um, that we just kind of like, assume it happens, we can actually calculate that and we can measure it too. If, and if you, sometimes you see bond dissociation energy, which is the energy you have to put in to get a bond to break, which sometimes is defined as the distance between the bonding and the anti-bonding orbital. Because you have, sometimes you have to put more energy in to break it once it's formed because it's already stable. All right. Um, I thought just thought this was a this was from P Table, um, P Table.com because they have really interesting ways of visualizing the periodic table. 
um, that just had, this is um, sorted by electronegativity. Um, so just to remind ourselves where the most electronegative elements are, top right, excluding the noble gases. We are not gonna do much with those because um, they don't, especially the first three rows, don't form any bonds whatsoever because they already have a full octet. Once you get down here, what's different about krypton and xenon? There's a d orbital. They have a full octet. They also have a d orbital that could start being mixed in. So you actually can see noble gases making compounds, but you have to get past, um, past the p orbital to the d orbital to do that. Um, does anybody remember what the criteria was for whether it's a polar bond or not? It's a difference in like negativity. Anybody remember what the cutoff was? Point, point 0.4, 0 0.4, not point 0.04. And that's somewhat arbitrary, but the way I always remember it is carbon and hydrogen are sort of our poster children for nonpolar. We deal a ton with carbon and hydrogen bonds. And we consider, even though there's a difference in electronegativity of about 0.35, we consider them nonpolar. So basically, anything that's more polar bond than carbon to hydrogen, we consider a polar bond. And if it gets to be a big enough difference, then it, we actually consider it an ionic bond. But again, even that's sort of a sliding scale. Our original definition of an ionic bond before you were ever taught anything about electronegativity, um, what's the easiest, most general way to think about ionic bonds versus covalent? Anybody remember? If I said, is this bond covalent or ionic? Metal and a non-metal. Metal and a non that's, that's a good generalization. The more specific way of saying it is you need above a certain change in electronegativity between the two. But there's not a lot of agreement on textbooks. Should it be 1.8? Should it be 2.0? So because there's less of agreement there, um, and it really is a spectrum rather than a binary, it's either covalent or ionic. It is more of a spectrum. And so you can have covalent bonds between metals and non-metals um, as long as they're not too large of a difference in electronegativity. So that typically means for our non-metal attached to a, a metal, uh, it's going to be one of our less electronegative uh, non-metals. So carbon, sulfur, phosphorus, silicon. And it's one of the more electronegative metals. So we'll feel, oh, we will see some things. Um, we can make covalent bonds between carbon and magnesium. For instance, is a really useful way of making certain molecules is to attach a carbon to a magnesium because then that carbon and magnesium bond is pretty easy to then break and move stuff around. But we will see some covalent bonds um, to some extent between metals and non-metals. Um, the easiest way to remember if there's going to be a polar bond or not, these four attached to anything that's not one of those four is is going to be a polar bond pretty much across the board. Um, and again, there are some extreme cases. You can find combinations where they're relatively close together, like, like nitrogen and bromine, but nitrogen and bromine are really uncommon to pair with each other. So yes, you, you could, that would be a nonpolar bond, but it's not one that we're ever going to really use. We're not going to spend much time with it because it would be so uncommon. In a place like can't remember which um, which moon it is of one of the gas there's a moon of one of the gas giants that has ammonia as the dominant solvent on the on the moon rather than water um, so the temperature change is such that that ammonia is very very stable and exists in all three phases the way water does on Earth um, on that planet. And nitrogen and bromine might be more a more common thing and where we might have to take that into account more often. Just kind of remember that we do have a very Earth-centric view of chemistry, especially organic chemistry, because we're applying it to us and Earth. Um, but you can get more extreme conditions or on other planets where that's where some of these generalizations fall apart. Um, 
kind of fun to think about pH, neutral pH would on that planet um, would not be would not be seven because ammonia's dissoci auto dissociation constant um, is has a pKa of about 30. So a neutral pH can cure ammonia as the solvent is actually at 15 rather than at um, seven. So basically just your concentration of those dissociated ions, your protonated ammonia and your deprotonated ammonia are way, way lower in a neutral solution than they are in water because it's just harder to pull it apart, which is also kind of fun to think about. So on Earth, can I say that a carbon hydrogen bond is our standard for going yes, to solid? Yes, exactly. That's our standard for pull. That's where we draw the line. Anything bigger difference than carbon and hydrogen um, is a polar bond. All right, and so here's just a figure, um, a figure showing what what that looks like in terms of electron density when you do have a polar bond. Um, a polar bond and asymmetry towards the more electronegative side is where you're going to find all your electron density. So we have a partial negative. Yes, we use those those um, icons or those symbols, that lowercase delta in Gen Chem for partial positive, partial negative. We're going to use them a lot here. So it's worth remembering because when we're tra tracking down charges. Um, this right there is is a lowercase delta. Uh, it's one way of writing lowercase delta. That means it's a partial charge. It's not a full charge. So we wouldn't say that that's a negative charge. We'd say it's a partial negative by having that little that delta. Um, and we drop the our lowercase delta this way very specifically so we don't confuse it with calculus where you have partial differentials. Um, they do a lowercase delta like that. Uh, so for instance, if you were taking a partial derivative of pressure with respect to temperature of a system, you would write your differential term like that. Um, and so since we do use some of those in chemistry in various places, we need to differentiate our lowercase delta for charge is one with the, where that, not a tail, I guess. I don't know what you call that term in, in terms of um, letters. Um, it goes out the other way. You know, it's bad when not only have we run out of English letters, capital and lowercase, and we've started using Greek letters, we've actually started running out of Greek letters. Um, and we have to start differentiating between which way are we writing lowercase Greek letter. And this does wind up being a really big deal, like the second point says, because um, partial positives are attracted to partial negatives. And you have partial positives coming in and and donating and pulling electron density away from something else because it's a partial positive because it's missing electrons, right? And so a partial positive can come up to a partial negative and start of pull electron density away from it, which means we start moving away around some of those orbital shapes. We distort the bonding orbitals by bringing in outside electrons. And that means we can start seeing those orbital energies shift and you can start seeing bonds breaking uh, if you do that. And that's going to be one of the primary cases or primary ways we cause reactions to happen. Say that. Yeah. On that last molecule, like if you had another fluoromethane and that um, the fluorine got close to the methane group, would it like pull the electrons away from that other fluorine? Yeah, or even um, sometimes if it was another fluoromethane, that's going to affect things like its melting point, its boiling point, because those molecules are attracted together. But if you happen to have something like so, like fluoromethane, and you bring in something like a hydroxide ion that's a full negative charge, that partial positive is going to look really attractive to that negative charge, right? And so those, one of those lone pairs from the oxygen here can come in here and actually start to attach to that carbon. 
but you can't have a carbon with five bonds, right? So in order for that to happen, the fluorine would need to leave. And when the fluorine leaves, it takes its electrons with it because it's more electronegative. And so you would actually wind up, this is, this is one of the first reactions that we'll really explore in detail, although I don't think this year we're going to get to until second quarter. Um, it's known as an SN2 reaction or backside attack. They, but basically what happens is the leaving group leaves as your a new group comes in that's going to be donating electron density. And what that looks like in terms of those orbitals is it's donating electron density into the antibonding orbital, which makes this bond weaker and allows the fluorine to take its electrons and go home. And so, following, I mentioned on, I think, the first day of class, but either whichever day it was, out of the four fundamental forces, the only one we really care about in, in chemistry on a regular basis, unless we're doing nuclear chemistry, um, the only one of the force, four fundamental forces we care about is electromagnetism. Everything we do in chemistry can be explained through electromagnetism, including the orbitals. Um, and so, that means charges are the number one thing we're looking for, even partial charges. So being able to look at a molecule and find where is the partial positive, where is the partial negative, is going to tell you um, where the reaction is going to happen. Um, here's just some practice with polarity. Um, but uh, I already mentioned our criteria. Um, and you might be able to look at these at this point without drawing the full Lewis dot structure and tell me which ones are polar and which ones aren't. What's that first molecule look like? CH2O. Yeah, we've got two different things attached to a center atom, right? Carbon's going to be our center atom because it's the least electronegative. Well, it's not the least electronegative, but you can never have hydrogen as a central atom. So carbon's our central atom. And so that means you've got a carbon-oxygen bond. It's polar. Not everything around the carbon is identical, so it's asymmetric. Boom, polar. How about NH2Cl2? That one might be a little bit harder to visualize. Or sorry, NHCl2. How many bonds does nitrogen normally want to form? Three. So what does that tell us about this molecule? The nitrogen's our central atom. What else do we know about it? It's a lone pair. It has a lone pair. So we've got plenty of asymmetry. And actually, oops, I mixed that up. Yeah. Does that polar bond? Hydrogen, nitrogen. The nitrogen to chlorine draws your attention, right? Because those are both electric. Negative elements, and if you check their their values, nitrogen and chlorine are close enough. That's a non-polar bond, but we still have a nitrogen hydrogen. So this is going to be the overall polar molecule. Last but not least, I don't think we even need to draw this one out. We already used the related molecule as an example. Non-polar, why? Yes. Four chlorines around the carbon. If it was, um, remember when we're looking at the asymmetry that the lone pair counts as an object around that central atom, right? So you can have three of the same thing around a nitrogen, um, but because it also has that lone pair taking up space, that gives it the asymmetry. Chlorine, no, or carbon, however, tetrahedral. All only four things attached to it, and they're all the same. You don't even need to look at whether it's a polar bond because it doesn't have the asymmetry. 
that should be fairly review, right? Feel fairly comfortable. Um, lab today is going to be playing around. We're going to mess around with some, some organic molecules and look at solubility and how solubility and polarity are related and melting points. We're going to do some practice with some basic um, lab skills where we um, I show you how to take melting points the OCHEM way, uh, which is, which if any of you did your research projects with, with anything OCHEM, you might have done um, melting points with the little tiny little capillary tubes. Did you guys do that at all? And there's like a little magnifying glass, a little block box that just gets really, really hot. It has a magnifying glass and capillary tube goes inside there. And that's the, uses you know, one tiny little crystal of an organic molecule rather than having to get like a test tube and heat up the whole test tube over a Bunsen burner or something like that. Um, so we'll get some practice with that today and we'll tie that to polarity. Um, here's some more practice for drawing molecules. Um, in interest of uh, not spending too much time in class working on this, um, this is mainly just so that you can start getting some some proficiency going back and forth between skeletal structures and complete structures. Um, and also, so you can practice counting to four, but not five, right? So this carbon right here, how many hydrogens does it have attached to it? Zero, it's already got four bonds. How about that one? One. How about there? Three. It's an SP3 carbon at the end of a chain. Therefore, it's going to have three hydrogens attached to it to give it a total of four bonds. Um, it's not technically correct for the skeletal structures to even to show hydrogens attached to nitrogens or even to oxygens. But for the sake of, because oxygens and, and nitrogens can become charged relatively easily by protonating or deprotonating them, it's usually worth writing out OH instead of strictly speaking as a skeletal structure that we would just write that as O and the H is assumed to be there the way we would with carbon. Um, I'm not gonna be picky when I say draw the, the skeletal structure. I'm mostly looking for the carbons to be drawn way we think of carbons as a skeletal structure, um, which is there's a carbon at the end of every line, unless there's a different element written there. And so this line right here, that's a carbon because it's there's nothing shown there. Sometimes it gets it gets tricky because people say, well, is there a carbon and then a nitrogen? No, if a bond ends in another element, that means that you've got a carbon attached to that, that other element. We're not sticking an extra carbon in there, um, which is more or less what it looks like. Um, but just to, to reiterate, since that can be kind of a sticking point. Um, and I guess we didn't ever really define skeletal structure, but we started jumped in and started using it in lab, right? Um, so we can practice going the other way is actually sometimes harder. So let's practice this. Go from a complete structure to a skeletal, which is also called a bond line structure. 
it, it can be helpful to do sort of a rough drawing. Don't try to do it perfect the first time. If you're doing one of these um, translating one way drawing to the other, sometimes it can be helpful to just get it roughly what it's going to look like and then clean it up and try and draw it with the right bond angles after you have a, a general idea of what it's going to look like. And I usually find it helpful to sort of, so for one, don't think left to right. And if you have some carpets that are not SP3, a lot of times pick those as sort of your frame of reference and start from those because S in a complete structure, SP3 carbons are drawn with these 90 degree angles, right? But they're not really 90 degree angles. They, when you draw it on a skeletal structure, they're going to look more like 120 degrees. But these ones are already drawn in the complete structure with the proper angles. So if you start from those and build around those, that actually can be kind of helpful sometimes. So I'm actually going to start with the alkene, our carbon-carbon double bonds. And I'm actually just going to reorient it just a little bit. To make that, I'm going to just take this and flip it up just for the sake of drawing. Um, alkenes have those, those 120 degree bonds and having those start at an angle and then go into the rest of the molecule can make things look weird. And this is a Okay, place to start because it's relatively simple. On one side of the alkene, we have two single carbon groups, right? That are both SP3. So that's, we're done with everything this way. And on the other side, we have hydrogen going up, which we won't draw because it's a skeletal structure. Carbon down. And then it's an alkyne, which is the carbon-carbon triple bond. And alkynes always look weird in skeletal structure because they have a 180 degree bond angle. So it looks like a straight line. Um, so you have to be very careful. That you show where it starts and where it ends, that this is one bond ending and then a triple bond starting. And this is one case where I don't mind writing out the carbons and still calling it a skeletal structure because alkynes look so weird in the middle of the chain otherwise. Um, but I'll draw it this way first and then I'll go back and draw it uh, the other way that you can think about it. And then it's another carbon. And that's an SP3 carbon, right? We're at this carbon now. That carbon's SP3, which means we're doing tetrahedral structures, we're going to draw them as about 120 degrees. To an oxygen, to another sp3 carbon, sp3 carbon, alcohol. So your skeletal structure should look something like that. It's oriented at a different angle, that's fine. Not really worried about that. And again, it's really easy to lose track of carbons with, a, with an alkyne bond if you don't write them out. So I don't mind if we wrote this at like, it's not technically skeletal structure, but it keeps us from forgetting about that there's those extra carbons there. For that alkyne to actually put two lines around the bond. You have to be sure that you that you do it such that you can tell that there's an extra carbon in there because you got here's our alkene carbon. Then there's the start of the alkyne carbon is goes right there. And then there's the alkyne group. And then there's another carbon carbon bond that's a sigma bond, just a single bond. So you just have to be careful to make sure that you're showing, you're not showing the alkyne directly attached to that carbon. Because that would be a carbon with five bonds then. We know we can't do that. Right. Um, 
those are kind of the trickiest structures to draw. The alkynes in general are the trickiest ones to draw, functional groups to draw because of that 180 bond angle makes skeletal structures look weird. And you have to be careful not to lose carbon in there. Uh, and this also is a good time to the other style, this complete structure, which you've been, we've been working with where you draw everything out. There's skeletal structure. Um, there's the other two types of structures are called uh, condensed structure, which is basically, it's mostly a holdover from the fact that they used to have to set to um, use printing presses and typeset these organic molecules using typewriters or physical letter tiles. Um, and so there was a lot of, it was really, really helpful to be able to write your structures in a single line of text. So a lot of times you'll see or relatively complicated organic structures represented and with a lot of subscripts um, and parentheses. For instance, um, if we had, like, sorry, if we had, Let's say we had this molecule, the complete structure looks like this. The skeletal structure would look like one, two, three, four, five, with a single carbon coming off the middle. The condensed structure for this, we write as CH3, CH2, CH parentheses CH3, CH2, CH3. And with the parentheses, is we know that every carbon is supposed to have four bonds, right? So when you get to a carbon that doesn't have four bonds, and then you see parentheses after it, the parentheses are indicating that is attached to this other carbon that's missing bonds. So you can see how if you're doing this on a typewriter, it's really helpful to be able to do this since they didn't have good ways to draw figures. Um, if you look at, at an OCHEM textbook from the from the 50s or 60s, the structures, the way they're drawn are really, really weird um, to our eye because we're so used to being able to just use a computer to draw stuff in whatever angles we want. They had to think in 90 degrees because that's how print, printing presses worked. So if, if you were a publisher and you were trying to publish or getting things your textbook and you needed a line that went into at 120, degrees you actually had to either physically make a new tile or order it in order to print that book the way that that the author wanted drawn um so you do still see this to some extent this is what condensed structure is we'll get some practice with it but in general it's kind of archaic at this point it's useful as a way to save space sometimes if it's a really common molecule people can recognize um but more frequently, we see it as sort of a combination of skeletal structure and condensed structure, uh, which is called the Kakuli structure. After, obviously, Kakuli, the guy who, who took his inspiration for benzene and resonance from, from ancient mythology, um, the Kakuli structure is basically something in between a complete structure and a skeletal structure, but instead of drawing out every hydrogen, you write out all of your hydrogens just with next to a carbon. So for this molecule, we might write it out as CH2OH, CH2. So it's not quite either skeletal structure or That's kind of a combination of all of them put together. It's a very convenient way to, to draw things because it, you don't have to write out all of your hydrogens, but you can still show all of the structure more or less um, and make sure that you don't lose carbons. Um, the trick with this is it's hard to always make it look right because drawing these lines 
um, we try to draw the line such that you show the bond in between the, the larger atoms rather than the hydrogens, but it's not always possible. But um, I frequently use various bastardized forms of all of these simultaneously. I'll draw skeletal structure here, and then I'll switch to Kekuli structure for the part of the molecule that's actually going to react. Um, so it's kind of just, I want you to have seen all of them for the sake of, of um, not being too confused. And I don't get very hung up other than your, your midterm. Um, in this class where I'm specifically testing, can you count the four but not five? And do you know what complete structure is versus this these other ones? Um, so on your midterm, I will have you do a problem where I say, here's a skeletal structure, write the complete structure, or here's a complete structure, write the skeletal structure. But in general, on homework and stuff like that, I don't care which format you use um, or some combination of them because there are various times where in the same in the same problem where you need it to be shown different ways or it's convenient to draw it different ways. All right. Let's take our break. Let's come back at five after. We'll talk about functional groups and any other questions you had specific to those from the quiz, and then we'll talk about how electrons behave weird tomorrow.
fun fact about gut biomes that I learned recently. By recently, I mean in the last several years. Recent takes on a different meaning. Lower I get. Um, since I was in school, I've learned that, that, that there's some interesting research. Um, the appendix is no longer considered a vestigial organ because there's a lot of research now that indicates people that have their appendix taken out early on have much less diverse gut biomes and don't recover as quickly um, from antibiotics. Um, so the, the thinking is, because what the appendix basically is, is a little pouch at the, in, at the beginning of your small intestines that, that sometimes gets closed off and infected, and that's what causes appendicitis and it has to be removed. But the thinking now is that that small little pouch is there on purpose as sort of a petri dish to keep your gut biome constantly um, being replenished by bacteria that are supposed to be in your small intestines. And I'm not, I'm not a medical doctor, so I may have mixed up the exact anatomy, but it's the beginning of one of the intestines. I think it's the small intestines, um, the small intestine. And that's, that's the thing is that it serves a purpose because it allows you to recover from, um, up from food poisoning or, you know, obviously we're, antibiotics haven't been around enough for us to have evolved a way to recover from antibiotics, but it has the added benefit for us in modern times being able to recover from antibiotics more quickly as a result of having that tiny little pouch that sort of sequestered away from the rest of the digestive tract that all it does is sort of like constantly spew bacteria into the, your small intestines, um, which is kind of cool when you think about it. It's a very interesting little adaptation that somehow became useful for humans at one various point. You know, like before we were actually humans per se. All right, so the quiz was, um, part of the quiz was uh, just identifying functional groups. And again, we'll explain why different functional groups look the way they do, why they behave the way they do, um, their relative stabilities and all that kind of one at a time. Um, but in general, we we'll already be able to discuss structures on molecules. It's really helpful to have that shared language. So like I mentioned, it's sort of like in Gen Chem when you're forced to memorize the periodic table names and formulas, just or names and, and symbols, so that there's some, some fluency when it comes within the class in order to communicate. Functional groups are the same way. Um, this is this figure is not necessarily, not, don't worry about memorizing this right now. We'll have a whole chapter on alkenes, I think right after the midterm, um, where we talk about how they all react. But this is just to show that in different molecules that have an alkene group, most of them will go through the same chemical reactions because it's really, it's not the entire molecule as a whole that does the reacting. It's the functional group that does the reacting. So most molecules with similar functional groups will go through similar reactions. And you can track the overall structure before and after. If you look at this molecule, it doesn't really change overall shape. Um, beginning to end, right? All that happened is we were able to use this um, with platinum as a catalyst. If you use hydrogen with platinum as a catalyst, you're able to break that carbon-carbon pi bond and add hydrogens to each side. And that happens regardless of what else is going on in the molecule. It doesn't matter if it's a ring structure, it doesn't matter if it's this weird, this is called a bicyclic structure because it's two cycles attached, sort of fused together. Um, it's a six-sided ring with a five-sided ring sort of fused in the middle of it. Or you can think of it as a hexagon where you've connected the two opposite ends with a single carbon. Um, and we'll get practice drawing those structures. Those, those are really cool structures. But it doesn't matter what the rest of the structure is. You can find an alkene. And you can recognize this is something that reacts with an alkene. We can predict what the product's going to be. And that's the bulk of of really the, the material, especially the volume of the material we'll cover in this series is, here's a functional group, here's all the different ways this functional group reacts, and here's some wrinkles that, that kind of tweak the reaction. And then we go to the next chapter, and, and here's a different functional group, and this functional group reacts this way with these things. 
and then we'll start to start make it cohesive by by kind of turning it into a giant puzzle. Sometimes, like, okay, I'm starting here. How do I get it to look like that? How do I go from A to B? What are the steps? How can I add functional groups? Use functional groups. Um, use the reactions we've learned, and that's what's known as synthesis, and that's really the trickiest part of OCHEM, especially at this level, is keeping track of all the various functional groups and how they all react to put them together so you can make sort of a roadmap of reactions to get from point A to point B. Um, right now, if you think of it, go with, with the roadmap analogy, you guys just moved into town, have no idea what roads go where, or even if there is a road that goes there, or even if the town is over there. Um, we're going to start filling that in, but the more time you spend in it, the more fluent you'll get, the more you're able to start visualizing in your head, oh, if I take if I take Al Tahoe to 50 and hang a right, and then I can go right at Ski Run, and then the sushi place is on the right. Like, you can start to visualize in your head the more time you spend in a town, right? OCHEM and functional groups are our town. That's what we're doing. Um, and so that's why we need to be able to, to discuss them. Um, so this is just another table. This is the table uh, from that book we used last year. I actually haven't found our new OpenStax textbook is gonna have a table that looks just like this as well. It might not be table 2.1, but I'll go find that one as well. Um, and speaking of which, they did publish the full edition. Um, it's now available on OpenStax, but that'll be we'll used for the whole year. Chapter one through 12 is good enough for, for first quarter. Um, and you can't get a print edition of the full textbook yet and it's like it's like 1400 pages it's a giant monster of a textbook and i'm really looking forward to being able to get a print copy of it um, but it's not ready yet um, so uh, if you are planning on taking the whole series you can go on OpenStax and get that full edition downloaded um, and I'll, I'll update i think the link that's posted in the syllabus and on the website takes you to the OpenStax download. It's not the PDF itself, so it should be updated already. Just go to that link. Um, did anybody have any trouble identifying specific groups in, on the quiz? I mean, when you know what you're looking for, it's really kind of straightforward once you know what an R group is, right? Um, you see that is also used here. R, oxygen, R. Is an example of an ether. Doesn't matter what R is. Doesn't matter if they're if they're symmetrical or not. Sometimes more. It's more correct in the sense that more complicated takes care of some of the the what if questions. Um, sometimes you will see stuff like ethers written as R one to an oxygen to R two. R one and R two can be the same, but they don't have to be the same. But again, if you don't see it specified, it's just R, that just means it's a place, right? And again, talking about how, how um, all these different functional groups, regardless of the rest of the molecule, will go through the same reactions, makes it really easy to see why you would have R groups written, right? Because it doesn't matter if I'm showing you that an alkene reacts a certain way, I'll put R groups on it just because I don't want to draw the rest of the molecule or I want it to be the general case. Um, some of these are less common than others, some are more reactive than others. And again, we'll, we'll add, oops, I'm adding up the key on this one. We'll add different functional groups as we go. Oh, that's what happened. It was a text box from last time we did this. Um, so those are the answers. If you're looking at this, if you're trying to identify the various functional groups, Um, basically, like I said, it's just a way of sort of grouping. You can look at the molecule as a whole. The entire molecule has a specific name, but within that molecule are a bunch of other smaller functional groups. And that's an all, all is the sum of all of those put together in this very specific way. 
Um, and so when we say, okay, well, here's the nitrogen attached to some other carbons, that makes it an amine. That's the definition of an amine. It's a nitrogen on, attached to, um, to a carbon or several carbons. Then again, you happen to have a nitrogen attached to a sp2 carbon as a carbonyl group. But this this specifically is called the carbonyl carbon double bonded to an oxygen. When you have a nitrogen attached directly to that carbon oxygen double bond, that makes it an amide rather than a amine. Right. So there's some nuance there that we'll get used to. Um, and what we're going to spend the rest of the time on today is starting to talk about things like this. It's this aromatic group, also called a phenyl group, also called a benzene ring. Those are all different ways we use those different terms in different contexts, but they all mean more or less the same thing. It's this group of six carbons with alternating double bonds. So six sp2 carbons in a ring with the alternating double bonds um, gives it very specific properties. Uh, and so that's, that is its own functional group because it doesn't behave the same way as alkenes do. Alkenes, despite the fact this looks like it's just three alkenes next to each other, the fact that it's in a ring structure and that they're the alternating double bonds means it reacts differently than alkenes. So it's its own functional group. Right? So like, once again, there's, there's sort of layers. Right? And, that's, and hybridization is sort of the broadest way of describing these things. That's why we start with that. So whether you consider that an alkene or an aromatic, it's sp2 carbons either way. Um, and so if you wanted more practice identifying them, here's another big molecule. And again, lots of function or lots of um, uh, pharmaceuticals are relatively large organic molecules, or you can think of them as relatively small polypeptides. Um, this is really close to being a polypeptide because this is proline, the amino acid proline. Proline? Is proline one with the ring structure in it? It's been a while since I taught biochem, but it's an amino acid. As, um, and then it's when an amino acid links to another amino acid in, bio, in biology, you call it what, what type of bond? It's a, a peptide bond it links to amino acids. Um, but in no chem, that when they link that peptide linkage, we, we call that an amide. So a peptide bond is just a very specific amide group. It's, that specifically is making linking together amino acids to make a small protein chain or a large protein chain, right? So different classes will call the same thing a little differently. And this is, you can see lots of nitrogens close to carbonyls and not exactly next to each other. So this is not in a mine because you've got an sp3 carbon in the way, but it's close. Um, and we see that a lot with pharmaceuticals because if, if there's a specific small polypeptide that reacts with your body, interacts with your body in a certain way, if your body uses it as a chemical messenger, as a hormone to trigger certain reactions in different parts of the body, a lot of times, like I talked about with, with the halides, tweaking it just a little bit so it doesn't fit quite so well makes it so that your body can't get rid of it quite the same way it normally would and causes a desirable reaction in the body. So a lot of pharmaceuticals are basically how do we gum up this naturally occurring process, but not too much? Um, because you do it too much and you get where you get irreversible binding um, or a, if it binds too well to those receptor sites, you can wind up with the entire process stopping, which is effectively with nerve gases. Nerve gases are molecules that basically get in the way of an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase that breaks down acetylcholine naturally. And if you irreversibly bind to that enzyme, you get a buildup of acetylcholine in your body, which causes lots of things. I think what's the, there's an acronym for remembering what it is, but it's like salivation, lacrimation, it's sludge. Salivation, lacrimation, which means tearing, uh, urination, defecation, death, um, in that order. Um, so that's all they are is pharmaceuticals that are way too good at binding. Um, so we do wind up with these sort of complicated looking structures designed specifically to mimic um, naturally occurring molecules, but not mimic them too well. All right, 
we've already done a fair bit of practice with that. Um, here's just another, there's some, some examples here. These are very good examples of, of um, questions that, that will get asked on the midterm. The first test in this class, the midterm is um, going to be a lot of the basic skills. And then from then on, it's going to be a lot of, here's a page of reactions. What's the product for every reaction? And how does it happen? Um, but we'll get there first. And so one of those primary skills is draw out all the carbon atoms, hydrogens, atoms, lone pairs for the following compounds, or identify the hybridization for every heavy atom in this molecule. So there's some practice problems here. I'm not going to stop and go. Okay, so let's, let's do caffeine real quick on the right. Let's just, and instead of drawing all, we can do the draw all carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, and lone pairs. Um, but I'm just going to go through and do it quickly and get to the molecular formula. Um, there's some nitrogens, some oxygens, some carbons, and some hydrogens. So molecular formula, if you can get to the molecular formula properly, that also means you have to be able to do all these other things properly, right? Um, so we're going through here. We've got, I'm just going to go through and count carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. The other thing you can do is come up here and write out what elements are present, and then we're going to go in and just fill in the subscripts by counting. So A carbon, C8. Counting hydrogens, not particularly tricky. Sometimes it can be helpful to do it just with little going in and just draw the little carbon hydrogen bonds. Um, so one, two, three, none there, right? Already four bonds, already four bonds. One, two, three. So we're at six, zero, zero, seven, eight, nine, ten. Unless I miss the carbon or I count it wrong somewhere, I get 10 hydrogens. Right, so C8H10. Nitrogens and oxygens are easy at this point, right? Because they're drawn explicitly in there. So 4N, 2O. Um, there's not a whole lot of standardization as to what order you write the elements in. You've got four elements. You write them like from smallest to biggest. Usually in OCHEM, we write carbons first. And then after the carbons, we would go from least electronegative to most electronegative. But it really doesn't matter if you switch oxygen or nitrogen or, or even put the hydrogen somewhere at the back. It doesn't make a difference. It's still the same molecular Easy enough, right? As long as I'm up here doing it with you. Um, but I think you guys all have a decent handle on, on that, right? Um, oh, if we need to show three-dimensional, so going along with the 2D structures, if we need to throw three, show three-dimensional structures and we're hand drawing it, um, if we're doing it on a computer, we can always get the 3D structure like we did before from Moldview from, from a program that's designed to show the three dimensions, you know, twist it around, rotate it in whatever way it makes it look the figure look the way you need it to. Um, but when we're hand drawing it or if we're not using a 3D program, dots and wedges. So those of you who have had me for Gen Chem are familiar with this and I've already been using it, but um, a wedge always means it's coming out of the board towards you. And so think of it like if it's a, a the bond was a pipe, it looks like it's bigger when it's pointed towards you, right? The end that's towards you is bigger. So we make it as a wedge with the, whatever's coming out of the board has the larger side of the wedge. Um, and anytime you have something going away from you, you do it with the wedges. Um, and the wedge is basically just indicating, okay, just like you would dot a line, if you were drawing a, a cube and you wanted to show the lines that were behind the rest of the cube, I wanted to show the rest of them, it would be really common to 
draw some dotted lines like that, right? That's effectively what the uh, dots are showing. This is behind the, the plane of the board or the plane of your paper. Um, occasionally, you do get a case where you have you wind up drawing a 3D structure where you've got wedges coming out towards you, and then you've got a bond that where the entire thing is relatively even, but it's in front of the board. So you just draw that one as being an extra large line. So not really a wedge, it's more just like a box, but that's indicating that's still single bond, but it's pointed out towards us. If you squint and tilt your head just right, it does kind of look like you're giving it sort of a rough perspective in, in artistic terms. Um, we don't expect chemists to be artists. In general, that's a good assumption to make. I don't expect you to be artists. So we just have these conventions to show three-dimensional structure without actually having to be good at drawing things in perspective. Um, and then anytime you've got a bond crossing another bond, one that's in front, you just, you just um, leave a little gap so it's obvious which one's in front, which one's behind. Takes a little practice. It's easy enough when somebody else draws the structure for you to kind of use these rules and figure it out. When you're drawing it yourself, um, it'll take a little bit getting used to it. Here's another view of that bicyclic structure that I showed before. Remember I said it could be, you could think of it like a hexagon where the ends are connected with each other. If, if you took that same structure the way it was drawn like this, you take this structure and you flatten it out so that that point that connects the two ends is out towards us. The hexagon is more or less flat then. And then you have these two carbons or this single carbon pointed out or above the board towards us, right? So it's, it takes getting used to thinking of these in three dimensions and sort of thinking about how you would twist it around, draw it differently. And there are different cases where you will draw it one way and then you'll need to turn around and draw it. The same molecule rotated around the next step. Um, but we'll get more practice with that. And this one, that's, that's biochemistry. Um, just because they can't even be bothered to draw wedges and dashes, so they just draw their carbohydrates, their simple carbohydrates, um, like it's a straight line. Um, I don't like that one because I can never remember. There's a way of drawing of either the horizontal ones are either always wedges and the vertical ones are always dots into the board or the other way around, and I can never keep it straight. And I barely ever use that anyway, but I want you to have seen that. That is, that is a common way in biochem specifically of drawing um, uh, sugars specifically when they're in their open chain form. All right. So here was the other quiz question. Just identify the hybridization, right? Pretty straightforward, getting good at that. Just another way of counting count electron groups, right? So how many electron groups are there around this oxygen? What's the hybridization? SP2. SP2. How about this carbon, C2? SP3, that carbon, carbon one, also, also SP2, because it is the other end of that pi bond, right? Anytime you've got a pi bond, you're going to have an sp2 or maybe even an sp on either end of that pi bond. So one end of that is the oxygen making it sp2, the other end is the carbon. So that carbon's sp2. And what about n1? It looks like it's sp3. The way it's drawn here, it's sp3. However, this is a case where things get weird because that line, that nitrogen has a lone pair, right? Anytime you have a lone pair next to another pi bond, those electrons can wind up overlapping a little bit and sort of spreading out more in a process called resonance. Um, and that resonance Basically, it just means that there's another way of drawing this. It's, it might not be quite as stable, but you can actually have a 
if we drew it like We drew the same molecule, but we made the nitrogen share its lone pair. We gave it four bonds instead of three. That allows the oxygen, the most electronegative element, to actually have an extra electron density around itself, which is not as good as having everything with a um, neutral charge. But having the opportunity to do that means that's another set of orbitals we can kind of mix in together to make things slightly lower in energy. And so all of a sudden, what's the hybridization on this nitrogen now? Now it's sp2, right? So even though we would call it sp3, looking at it here, if we actually calculate the structure for this and we look at what the shape is, then this nitrogen is not tetrahedral. It actually behaves like it's sp2 because it's because you've got a lone pair adjacent to a pi bond, which means there's two ways you can draw it. Thing is, you can't constantly be switching back and forth between sp2 and sp3 because if you're constantly switching geometries, then that means you're actually moving where this hydrogen is every time you switch back and forth, right? And these nuclei behave really, really weird. Um, not really, really weird. They're so much bigger than the electrons that basically they're considered stationary. The electrons are so small that they can kind of be everywhere at once. They're moving. One way to think about it is that, that they're moving so fast that they're in both of these structures simultaneously. Those electrons are constantly flickering back and forth here. So really what's happening, really we're mixing the two orbitals together to get something that's more stable. So it's really like both are true at the same time, but we can't really draw that very easily. Um, so if that's the case, we can't have the atoms, we can't have the nuclei moving in order to do that. Because the electrons need to be moving so much faster and the nuclei are so slow. And so what we get is a situation where it's both of these simultaneously and if both the oxygen and the nitrogen will behave like their sp2 in terms of geometries, All right? And that process is called resonance. And we get lots of practice with this because this is a really weird concept. And it takes a lot of practice. You're just getting good at drawing structures and figuring out hybridization and now I throw in, but really it's neither of these, right? Um, and actually just for historical reference, has anybody ever wondered what Oppenheimer did to get put in charge of the Manhattan Project? Like you don't know his name, like you know Einstein or Bohr or, or even a lot of the scientists that worked on the Manhattan Project on the, the day to day, right? Um, that assumption that I said, that the atoms are so much bigger, the nuclei are so much bigger that they don't move relative to the speed of the electrons, is called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So Oppenheimer was the one who came up with the idea that resonance can happen, and it happens so quickly that the atoms can be considered standing still. The nuclei basically don't move because everything else is happening so quickly. Um, and so it was really a fundamental piece of what turned into computational chemistry um, and, and figuring out how we can actually apply the idea of wave functions and actually get some energies, get some useful numbers. Oppenheimer was one who um, made that possible, that allowed us to bridge that gap between here's the theory and here's how it behaves in practice. And Oppenheimer made that jump. Um, so he actually, he was a big contributor beyond just being an administrator at the uh, Manhattan Project. I like that I can use that example now. Now everybody knows who Oppenheimer is because before I'd say that in half the class of who, you know, in charge of the Manhattan Project, but now everybody knows who Oppenheimer is, more or less. It's Killian Murphy. Um, again, here's more practice with this. And so for right now, one of the things I want to look at is which, so we, let's look at the hybridization on caffeine. And then specifically, I want you to look at if it's a, a lone pair 
next to a pi bar or adjacent to a pi bar, shift it down one hybridization level. Right, so this nitrogen here looks like it's sp3 on paper, right? But it's also adjacent to not one but two pi bonds. So it's lone pair that doesn't actually stay in one spot. It's lone pair can participate in those resonance structures. So that nitrogen will actually behave like it's sp2. <clears throat> Let's see. How about that nitrogen? It's already sp2. It's already got the pi bonds. We don't, so the lone pair doesn't affect it. Right? So resonance will never take an sp2. It's something that's already got a pi bond and shift it into sp because it's already got it's the p orbital that would need to use to mix in is already being used for a pi bond. So its lone pair is basically just stuck here, perpendicular to the rest of the structure. So it's really when you have something that looks sp3 with a lone pair and there's a pi bond next to it, that's what tweaks that, that hybridization. Most of our rules for hybridization haven't changed. So how about that oxygen? SP2, because it's already got the five bonds. And it's got, so it still has its two lone pairs, but their lone pairs are pointed 90 degrees from everything else. It's already got that high bond that's, that's participating. And are there any nitrogens that aren't SP2? No. That nitrogen has a lone pair, but it's next to two other pi bonds. So it's gonna have that planar shape. That nitrogen has a lone pair, but it's adjacent to a pi bond. So all of the nitrogen's shown here, sp2. The nitrogen on the very bottom, um, in the middle there, is that gonna share uh, its lone pair with its big pi bonds on both sides? Like, yeah. Turns out this is a mole. Caffeine's um, one that has a ton of different resonance structures because every one of those lone pairs, um, well, not every one of the lone pairs, all the lone pairs on nitrogen that look sp3, like that lone pair could wind up being shared this way or it could be one shared this way. Can't be both at the same time, but it means that there's a lot of different structures we could draw, a lot of different resonance structures. Um, for each of these, like this nitrogen lone pair could go this way, and this nitrogen could hang on to the extra pair of electrons and have a negative charge and a positive charge. This nitrogen could share its electrons this way or that way. And then you wind up with things like, well, then this pi bond could actually move over here and allow the oxygen to hold it that way if this nitrogen is pointing its electrons. Like there's a ton, this is a, a really complex case because there's so many options. We'll do some simpler ones where I'll say, Draw all the possible resonance structures that are not nearly as many as this one. Um, but why caffeine is worth looking at is the way we can show that this that all these nitrogens are sp2. Um, if we clear, let me clear this real quick. Every that means every single atom in these two rings is sp2, which means they should all be trigonal planar, right? And if we actually look at the three-dimensional structure here, if any one of them was sp3, it would show up as tetrahedral. We'd be able to see that by looking at bond angles and stuff, right? Uh, if we pull up a mole view, um, its default molecule, when you bring it up, is caffeine. If we look at the structure here, it's totally planar, right? So that's one of the ways that we know that this resonance actually happens is because we can look at the structure of stuff like caffeine and say, well, if resonance wasn't really a thing, that nitrogen should be tetrahedral. That should be a trigonal pyramidal structure, not trigonal planar, but it's totally 100% planar. 
So resonance must be happening to allow that structure to happen. Um, and I bring that up because otherwise it's just, it seems like we're just making stuff up at this point, right? Like I can tell you what makes an orbital together and mathematically it works and it makes things more stable, but otherwise, like, unless we can actually compare it to something in the real world, it's like, what are you doing? What, what's, what's even happening? It's like that, that meme about mathematicians, right? Organic chemists have been playing us for fools. Is this real chemistry? Um, is that not a common, maybe that's not a common meme anymore. Maybe we're just in science circles. Um, anyway, so this is more practice thinking about um, orbitals, just reminding us how this works. Um, here's an example of an interesting case that we actually can observe happening. If you make this molecule, um, where we have actually start with this one, if you have a ketone, where you have a hydrogen on the carbon adjacent to it, if you take that ketone and you put it under the right spectroscope conditions, you can actually see that it spontaneously rearranges itself. Sometimes, this is an ongoing equilibrium reaction for every alkene. It rearranges itself to look like an alcohol in it and a alkene next to each other. I said alkene, I meant ketone. Every ketone with an adjacent hydrogen or rearrange itself to look like an alcohol attached to an alkene. And this is less stable than the ketone. So most of it shows up like this, but we can actually observe this happening. And the reason it happens is because when you get these orbitals overlapping, they can constantly be shifting back and forth. And so you can wind up with the bond, this bond breaking and forming the bond over here while the pi electrons move over to the oxygen at the same time. So you get this quick little swap of electrons back and forth that switches it from being a signal bond between oxygen and hydrogen and a signal bond between carbon and car and the hydrogen. And the pi bond between carbon and carbon and the pi bond between carbon and oxygen. All right, so we, we have all this experimental evidence that this weird stuff can happen with orbitals. Um, and so we're, we're spending the last 10 minutes talking about things. So, before Kukuli, before we knew what the structure of benzene looked like, what they knew about benzene was they knew the molecular formula. They knew it was way more stable than it had any right to be. Other, other molecules with similar formulas were really, really easy to burn, and they gave off tons of energy when you did. Benzene, on the other hand, doesn't. And then they knew that if you substituted, meaning if you put, if you replaced one hydrogen with something else, usually a halide like chlorine or bromine, if you replaced one of the hydrogens with, with bromine, you only got one product. You didn't get a mixture of several products. You only got one thing. Which is weird to think about what the implications of that are. But can anybody think of one, one possible? No matter what carbon it attaches to, it's like kind of the same molecule. Yeah, so either, either all six carbons are identical to each other, or, um, or one carbon is really, really reactive and other five aren't. Those are really the two possibilities, right? It's possible that one of the six carbons is so reactive that nothing will ever happen with the other five. It only happens at the single carbon. So when they started thinking about the logic here, so from that, they were able to say, okay, well, what if we do two substitutions? When they did two substitutions, you get three products. So it can't be the one carbon is more reactive than everything else. And it seems very unlikely. Um, if we start trying to draw possible structures here um, that fit this formula, you could have something like 
bond angle one. But you could have something that looked kind of like that. You could have something that looked something looked like that, a straight chain molecule with all these pi bonds scattered in, but that should all, both of those should be really reactive in a bunch of places. So the, this experimental data is what led to the idea that, um, and Kukule was the one who came up with this, that benzene is this ring structure with alternating pi bonds, that's constantly switching back and forth. If we drew it like this, where you have, and let me white out the screen and redraw that. If you drew it as alternating pi bonds, remember that the carbon-carbon sigma bonds are longer than the carbon-carbon pi bonds, right? So you wind up with this not, not a true Not a true hexagon, it winds up having this sort of skewed warped shape where you've got some sides longer than other sides. If this was our structure, yeah, initially all of our, our carbons are identical to each other, but when you do the second substitution, there should only be, there shouldn't be three possibilities. So if we put a chlorine here and then we're gonna run another chlorine, there should be like five other carbons you can put it on, right? In all of those, you should be able to tell those products apart from each other. Because adding another chlorine here versus here, well, now we've got our, car our chlorine separated by a pi bond versus having our chlorine separated by a sigma bond. So those should be two distinct products. And we do the same thing here and here. We get two distinct products, either sigma bond then pi bond or pi bond then sigma bond. And then this one's different than all of the other five, right? So if this was the structure of benzene, we should see five products when we do the second substitution. And that's not what we see. So Kukuli was the one who said, well, really, what if, what if it's constantly shifting where those pi bonds are? If it's constantly shifting where those pi bonds are, then on average, each of, each of what we're drawn as sigma bonds here are actually a little bit shorter than a regular sigma bond. And each of these alkenes is really a little bit longer than a, a regular alkene. And you actually would wind up with all of your carbons being symmetric that way. And so that's, that was the idea is constantly that this pair of electrons is constantly moving over. And these electrons move over there and these electrons move over there. And that shifts at this structure. And then this structure shifts back and they're constantly going back and forth. Um, the way that my myochem instructor phrased it, which is, he was a really weird dude. Um, he always phrased it as it's like a group of, it's like six ponies in a corral chasing each other in a circle. There's something magical about it. Um, literally, word for word, the way he described it. We used to keep notes on what weird stuff he said during the lecture. Um, and that was one of them. And so basically, you just have this ongoing electrons as ponies in a corral chasing each other in a circle that makes it really, really um, stable. And it's happening, and it's really, it's not, like I, I've said before, it's not really like it's switching back and forth between these. It's really that it's all of both possibilities simultaneously. You mix in the orbitals for both of these together and you get something that's even more stable than having either option separately. Right? And that also explains why that benzene doesn't go, it's unusually stable, it doesn't go through the same reactions that other alkenes do. Because as soon as you break one of these pi bonds, the fun's over. The ponies can't run in a circle anymore. 
as soon as you wind up with one of these carbons being sp3, what would that would wind up being two of them being sp3? Now all of a sudden, there's no extra pi bond here that can rotate back to being the other way, right? You've broken that magical corral of, of electronic ponies, and you that actually makes it less stable than normal. So benzene is more stable than other alkenes because it has these resonance structures. So in general, the more resonance structures you have, the more ways you can spread your electrons out, the more orbitals you can mix together, the more possibilities they are for getting more stable. So molecules with extra resonance are extra stable. And it's, and it's the same same as, as why do bonds form at all? Because it's more stable than not forming them. Why do, does resonance happen? Because it's more stable than keeping it in either of these two states on its own. It allows us to mix in more possibilities, which almost universally means we wind up with things being lower in energy. All right, so here's some practice with some much simpler molecules. Um, first off, let's look at this, this structure right here. What is the hybridization of, on each of the atoms above? The alkene part's easy to think about, right? We haven't really done much with ions, but that's gotta be what? SP2. Same here. If we have a carbon with a positive charge, normally a positive charge on one of our atoms means that it's sharing more than it wants to, right? But carbon, when it's tetrahedral, already is sharing as much as possible. It can't share anymore. So the only other way you can, the only way you can get a carbocation is by actually taking away a pair of electrons from carbon. And so a carbocation, so what if it's a positive charge on the carbon, it's actually going to be CH2 with a positive charge attached to the rest of this. And if we draw the Lewis dot structure for that in more detail, we get something that looks like this. If it had a lone pair, we would have a negative charge, right? Because then the carbon has access to five electrons and it normally has four. To have carbon with access, only access to three electrons to get a positive charge, that means it only has three bonds and it has no pair, no lone pair. So in other words, this carbon only has three orbitals bonding. which means in terms of hybridization, it has a spare P orbital that's not being used. So a carbocation is actually sp2. Because remember, we got sp3 because we wanted to, in order to make more bonds, we mixed all of our P orbitals and our S orbital together to get four possibilities, right? If we only need, need to make three bonds, and we don't need a place to put a lone pair, why would we mix in the third P orbital? Just leave it unused, it's empty. We can always mix it back in if we need to to make it SP3. But what this means is you've got an unused P orbital that's empty sticking up and down. So I drew it as though it was tetrahedral, but that carbon is actually trigonal planar. And if you have Let me, let me white out the board real quick to redraw this. So we've got our carbon. And this is a, let's say this is our carbocation. There's our unused P orbital. And then we have a hydrogen back and a hydrogen forward. Then over here, we have another carbon. And that carbon has a pi bond, right? Really, it would be at 120 degrees, but for the sake of showing this, I'm going to draw it as though it's all in a straight line. There's a pi bond in between those two carbons. That's what we did in alkene, right? What does a pi bond look like? Why is, go ahead. 
it goes around, right? It's you get a pi bond by mixing together two unhybridized p orbitals, right? So our pi bond kind of looks like like this. Where we have our two unhybridized p orbitals sort of overlapping with each other, right? Well, if these two p orbitals can overlap with each other to form a pi bond, and we have an empty p orbital right next to it, that one can too. So, really, what we see with in this case is we actually wind up with both possibilities at the same time. Where, but we wind up drawing it like this. That pi bond can sort of flip back and forth between the empty pi, the empty p orbital here, and the p orbital that it started with. If these electrons move over into the empty p orbital, they leave an empty p orbital where there was a pi bond, but that allows them to make an extra pi bond over here. So in this case, how do we know which of these structures is more stable, right? They both have a carbon with an with a empty p orbital, and they both have a pi bond between two carbons. They're identical. If they're identical in energy, there's nothing favoring either of them. And so we get both. And we can actually look at Here's what the orbitals look like without hybridizing those p orbitals. Those unhybridized p orbitals all lined up next to each other like that. They're all in phase, which means they all smear out. And we can extend that to the benzene example before. If we look at benzene, we look at the p orbitals on benzene, Every carbon had a p orbital going up and down, right? So benzene actually gets six unhybridized p orbitals all lined up that can all be in phase, smearing the electrons. Instead of getting three pi bonds, you actually get something that looks more like a donut above and below, where it's you've got the, the one phase, the unshaded phase donut on top and the shaded donut on bottom, where it's all of them smeared together into one big pi, they call it a pi system. And we can actually calculate that. If you take the individual functions, you take the energy that you get from each of them, and you mix them together to make a shape that looks like this, this is lower energy than having a pi bond and an empty orbit separate from each other. And so we draw them typically. If you have equal energy resonance structures, you draw them both. And you usually put brackets around it. The main thing, though, is drawing the arrow like that. So think back to your gen chem and equilibrium arrows. Go back to Cooley here. Cooley thought it was an actual equilibrium reaction, that it happened forward and back. It was constantly doing both. So he used equilibrium arrows, which, again, in case that's too pixelated, look like that. Or sometimes even just... An arrow forward over an arrow backwards, saying that the reaction happens both ways. We actually differentiate between resonance by saying, by drawing the arrows as a double headed arrow to say specifically, atoms are not moving, just electrons that we can draw them both this way, both of these ways equally. All right, and we'll stop there as well. We'll end with this.
This is from a different type of thing to teach. Um, if you take one thing that doesn't exist and you average it out with another thing that doesn't exist, you get something that does exist. <laughs> so those resonant structures don't individually exist, but the average of them does. The average of them, when we mix all the possibilities together, we get something that does exist. We call it a resonance hybrid. The things that don't exist are those individual structures that we call contributors. You average out all the contributors, you get the hybrid. And that's what we're going to practice on, on uh, Thursday. 